Okay, welcome everybody. Please take your seats and we will kick off. All right. Well, thank you everybody for joining us. It's an absolute pleasure to be moderating this discussion today. My name is uh, Dr. Kathy Serbara. I'm Deputy Director of Arctic Base Camp. And I have an amazing group of people with us today to talk to us about the impacts of global tipping points on health. We will have uh, also some welcoming words from Professor Gail Whiteman, who is founder of Arctic Base Camp. She is running from the Congress here as we speak. So she will be kind of slotted in when she is able to enter the room. So please bear with as we may uh, move the schedule around a bit. But the idea is that I'm going to give a bit of a welcome, tell you a bit about uh, who Arctic Base Camp is and what we do. I then have uh, a series of short talks from uh, amazing experts from polar science to global health and also uh, to provide you with a bit of a background in terms of what the World Economic Forum does uh, in this area. I will then welcome to the stage a group of panelists where we will discuss the solution space to how we tackle the climate and health crisis. And we'll also be bringing to the stage two of our youth ambassadors from uh, Arctic Base Camp as well to hear their insights into this super important topic. So it's a jam-packed schedule uh, and I'm super excited to be here with all of you today. And uh, if you have questions, amazing. We have a lot of time for Q&A at the end and I hope to make this as interactive as possible. So um, welcome your questions uh, in about kind of 30 minutes or so once we've gone through the talks. Okay. Let's kick things off. So we have the opening marks from Professor Whiteman, which will be coming shortly. So I will kick off with my introduction and tell you a bit about Arctic Base Camp. So Arctic Base Camp is a science communication platform and we speak science to power. So we've been here at Davo for the past seven years. We actually physically camp here at Davos next to the Hotel Schatz Alp. If you haven't seen us before, I welcome you to come and visit. Uh, you just have to take a funicular up and you will see our amazing tent and our team of scientists and uh, we all have been camping outdoors. I actually camped outside for the first time last night so please forgive me, I am slightly sleep deprived because of it, but it was actually very warm and cozy, so I, I highly recommend it. Winter camping might be my new thing. Um, but what we do here is essentially we take the message of the polls and we translate it into a way that speaks to all of us in the work that we do, because essentially what's happening in the polar regions is a barometer for global risks. Uh, and this is a really important message that uh, we've been, been spreading for the past seven years. So, and I'm going to give you a sneak peek in some of the tools that we're launching this week at Davo. So part of the work that we do is to showcase the, the polar science through kind of risk analytics. And we've developed this amazing platform called the uh, Global Climate Risk Platform, where uh, essentially what it does is it curates uh, all of the data that we have in an audience specific way. So whether you're involved in policy or business, you're interested in the data from a scientific perspective, you're part of the media or simply a concerned individual, you can go to our platform and you can find out what we have to offer. Another very exciting thing that we are launching this week is a collaboration that we're doing with uh, Oed Partners. And this is an uh, AI-driven uh, platform which collates news daily that have to do with uh, polar science and also extreme weather. And you can rotate this super cool globe and you can click anywhere and see the news stories of the day uh, from these two areas. And it, it's translated from over 100 languages and you can read the specific news stories 
um, from the source. And also on this globe, we highlight the climate tipping points, which our amazing scientist, Arthi, will tell you a bit more uh, in a few minutes. So really excited to have these tools at our disposal to help communicate the science of the polar regions um, more uh, globally. The other thing that we've been doing, which kind of ties into the discussions that we will be having today, is to speak more about the intersection of the tipping points to different areas, such as global health. And uh, this past year, we've been launching some videos and some uh, educational materials on how what's happening in the polar regions is affecting health in, uh, in climate vulnerable regions. And we've been working together with the Climate Vulnerable Forum on this. And it's been a really uh, exciting thing that we've been uh, starting to look at and we will look at more closely uh, in the year to come. And Professor Reitman will speak to that as well. So that's a bit about Arctic Base Camp. Uh, I'm in a minute, we will hear from uh, Jamila on, and from her expertise on global health. But first, I'd like to welcome, if that's all right, uh, Professor Whiteman to the stage to give also a bit of a welcome and a few words about what we do. Thanks, Kathy. Hi, everybody. It's great to be back in the SDG tent. Forgive me uh, for coming in a little bit late. We were in a session inside the Congress Center on something that's actually incredibly related to this topic. I just came from a, a small group meeting on extreme heat. Now, we know that in the Global Risk Report, extreme weather, again, is at the top of the list. But I think we now have another category where we start to take a look at health climate impacts, of which extreme heat would be the one that, that is certainly catching attention on one way, but it's also a bit of a silent killer on the other because it has less of a dramatic uh, visual uh, when it is a slow creep after days after days. Now, um, uh, Arctic Base Camp, of course, has been uh, uh, at the uh, SDG tent many, uh, for many different years, and we're thrilled to be here with, as Kathy has said, the, the health and climate and polar tipping point session and also an agricultural session that we have Friday morning. Um, but in addition to, to this, I think the, the idea that we have been beating the drum since 2017 when we first set up our first Arctic Base Camp in Canada to at Davos and are still uh, with many of the scientists and crew doing the, that hard winter camping. I think the issue of, of Arctic and now polar tipping points is a message that is starting to seep into both Davos participants as well as the, the World Economic Forum in terms of, of understanding that what happens in the poles doesn't stay there. So it's just not bad news for polar bears or for penguins, although it is, and for people that live in uh, the Arctic region, although it is. It's actually going to affect the fate of humanity. And Arthi's going to go through the science of the, 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 uh, you know, the speed talk on the polar tipping points. I'm not going to go through the science, but suffice to say, from my perspective as a social science, global risk is being turbocharged because of the things that are happening in the polar regions. And health is one of those. There's very little, if any, research that's put those two together. And we are really pleased, absolutely thrilled to announce a new grant together with the Wellcome Trust, the University of Exeter as the lead, the World Economic Forum, and our partners at Deloitte and the Climate Vulnerable Forum that will actually explore with research and then cutting edge communication technologies to get the message out, what are the additional climate health impacts of polar tipping points, which we are so close to triggering. So thank you, thank you for coming and, 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 and attending this session, and I really encourage the rest of you to, to engage with us after that. I will only be here for a little while longer, and then I'm going back, unfortunately, to moderate another session. Well, that's not unfortunate. It's unfortunate I can't stay for this one as well. Um, I'm going to turn back to Kathy and then the rest of the, the audience, and great to see everybody here. Thank you. Thank you, Gail. And now it's my absolute honor to welcome Dr. Mahmoud, and she will share a bit about her background and expertise in the space of global health. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. 
My name is Jamila. I come from Malaysia, and by training, I'm an obstetrician and gynecologist. Basically, I deliver lots of babies. Um, after delivering about 15,000 of them, I decided that I needed to do something else uh, and deliver more babies outside my country, and I set up an organization uh, working in the humanitarian sector uh, and did that for 20 over years, uh, looking at crisis around the world. Now, in 2000, I saw an image on television of a young baby being born on a tree uh, in Mozambique as the floodwaters were rising and there were crocodiles below and a South African helicopter picked her up. And it's, it sort of lived and it seared into my brain as, a, as an obstetrician. I cannot understand how she did it because I don't think I could do it. Now, fast forward 19 years later, I was in Mozambique after a terrible flood and playing with children and I was telling the midwife, um, I saw this image and that really changed how I look at crisis, I want to do things. And she just smiled and she said, that little boy you were playing with, well, his mother just gave birth on a tree. So I said to myself, something is so wrong that 20 years later, we are still living in in, in, in poly crisis, and things are not getting better. We have not done justice for people who are vulnerable. And I felt as a, you know, someone as a humanitarian that everybody thought was, you know, great. I was just putting Band-Aid on huge gaping wounds. And that's when I stumbled into and committed myself to planetary health, which is really looking at the intersections and the, the close correlation of health of humans with the health of the planet. So climate change is one element that is affecting us. It's also biodiversity loss, but it's all linked. And I love the fact that when you take planetary health, you look at it from a systems perspective, because health, the determinants of health, 75% is outside the health sector. It's environmental, it's social, it's economic, it's cultural, it's behavioral, right? And yet, we don't look at it that way. And the medical fraternity, only 15% of medical schools teach anything on climate and health. So we need to revolutionize education. Now, if you look at cause and effect, right, climate change, the, the tipping points, the melting of the ice, ice. I come from Malaysia, and if I ask someone on the street, you know, when the melting ice uh, in the poles, they probably think about the polar bears, right? And now we have to educate them. Actually, it, it is why we are getting more floods in our country. It is why, you know, that we are get, we have like frogs being boiled in water very, very slowly. Because you know, I come from Malaysia. It's hot all the time. It's either hot, very hot, or bloody hot, right? <laughs> uh, and 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 it's either dry and hot or wet and hot. So you know, so we don't realize that. And I took the climate stripes out. I went around, you know, the university and my friends and I said, what do you think this is? No one could really tell. And I said, well, this is our city where we're living and this is the temperature changes that's going on. So the impact of climate change and health is very, very profound, right? And now we're beginning to talk about it. It took 28 cops to have health on the agenda. So I'm not going to give you details on what health, I mean, anyone can look it up, but it does range from the impact of heat, impact of, you know, flooding, it's about the rise of infectious diseases, you now get dengue in Texas and get malaria in Washington, D.C., you will get more of the diseases that are normally in warmer climates in temperate countries as well. But more than that, it affects nutrition because there's going to be impact on crops. In impacts on the food that we eat that will be less uh, nutritious and therefore you will see a rise in undernutrition. Malaysia is a higher middle income country. We are seeing stunting in children in some parts of the city. So, you know, this is how, you know, we need to visualize. So I think what you're doing with the Arctic Base Camp, and I'm so happy you took a Malaysian girl up there last year who's now working with me. Um, and, you know, we need to do the same. We need to take you into the tropics as well and show you the impact of climate change on on our ecosystems, right? And I think this learning that we can make from each other, and I'm really, really grateful for the WEF community and, and Gail and others, you know, I think it, this is a circle that we need to just expand and, you know, we need to take very seriously. You know, one silent killer, or rather one silent epidemic that's going on that we're not talking enough about is actually the impact on mental health. So, you know, this is something that's affecting everyone, not just people in vulnerable countries, even places that are not vulnerable. People are worried about it. There's much more anxiety. And, you know, when I talk to businesses, I said, this is going to impact your workforce. 
right? Every time it starts raining in Malaysia in my office, I panic because it takes me an hour to get home. So if it rains, it's going to take me longer, right? So I even have anxiety because, you know, I need to be home on time, I need to have dinner, whatever. So, you know, these are the things that we are going to be facing. And last and not least, it's all interrelated, and that's microplastics. In every liter of water, bottled water, uh, plastic water, bottled water, or water, there are at least 240,000 particles of nanoplastics. Now, what is the impact of microplastics on us? It's also in the clouds, it's in breast milk, it's in fecal material, it's everywhere. So the impact is it causes a series of, it triggers something called neuroendocrine disorders, basically inflammation, which, and inflammation leads to every single diseases, disease that you can think on, from non-communicable diseases, diabetes, hypertension, cancers, infertility, all sorts of things. So we don't even know how we're going to deal with microplastics. But what do you do? They're plastics. Do you, do you dissolve them? You dissolve yourself, right? So, so what, what is going to happen in future? And with the melting, tip, melt, melt, melting ice, thousands of microbes, bacteria, viruses, you know, it sounds like a horrific m movie, right? But we don't know the impact on our health. What diseases will come after this? So the health community has to buck up. The global community and every community, business, academia, civil society, communities, everyone has to learn to work together because we can't solve it on our own. And this is where you need intense collaboration a lot more information sharing, but much more action. And I think we have to bring policymakers into the dialogue. We need to shift things, create new incentives, new disincentives, and basically learn to live life differently. Because we are living in a very different planet, and business as usual is not going to cut it. Thank you very much, everyone. I didn't even keep track of the time there because that was brilliant. So I was just going to let you go on. So to follow that up, we also have the amazing Arthi Ramachandran. She's a polar scientist, part of the Arctic Base Camp team, and she's going to talk to us about the polar science behind what we're seeing. Hi, uh, hi everyone. Uh, it's wonderful to be here and to follow Jamila. I'm a, a little bit um, <laughs> nervous because she's such a wonderful speaker and um, you know, and everything she said is so poignant, but I'm here to talk to you guys uh, a bit about polar science and what that means for the world. So we know that there are 16 climate tipping points that affect human welfare. These are all interconnected and nine of which are global. And so if these points are triggered, we will have global consequences and cascading consequences everywhere. And this fact affects the overall function of Earth systems. And, um, and so what's really interesting is actually that nine of these tipping points are located in polar regions. And six of the tipping points that are at risk of tipping between 1.5 to 2 degrees Celsius, five of those are in polar regions, four in the Arctic and one in the Antarctic. And it's often quite easy to forget these regions. They're far away. You don't really see them. They're hard to get to. Um, and so we don't realize that the consequences um, in these polar regions actually affect everyone globally. What's happening in the Ar Arctic and in the Antarctic doesn't stay there. There are global risks um, across the world. And it could be coming from loss of sea ice. And a small anecdote, when I was up in the Arctic for the first time back in 2017, we had to go out to the sea ice to take some ice core samples. And it took us a really long time to find any ice that we could go stand on. We were at 80 degrees north. And we finally found some ice, and so we said, great, let's go. And as we're walking on this ice, we realized how thin it is. It was about 30 centimeters thick. I had, you know, Coast Guard cadets falling through the water. 
I was taking a step and my boot went straight through and to think about the fact that there's 4,000 meters of ice cold water right underneath you is a really sobering moment because, you know, just a couple of years before that, the ice was about 1.5 meters thick and we didn't have any issues. People couldn't, you know, when we were trying to take ice cores, we had to like add an extension to go all the way down and now we could barely get this much of ice. And so seeing that change uh, was really sobering and it, it definitely created uh, a little bit of panic inside of me and, and made me think, okay, well, what can I do as a scientist to get this message across to everyone that what's happening here is happening four times faster than the rest of the world um, and it's kind of this canary in the coal mine and what happens when the coal mine collapses. Um, and so, like I was saying, since we've started taking measurements in the 1980s to now, sea ice thickness has drastically decreased. Um, for the past two decades, we've been constantly seeing new sea ice minima. Um, we're never going to get summer sea ice back in the same way that it was in the past, and this affects not only the people living in the Arctic, but also everyone across the world because it's increasing warming, it's amplifying climate change in ways that we don't always fully understand and we're still learning. Oops, sorry, trying to, yeah. Um, and if we take a look at Antarctica and Greenland, we are where we have massive amounts of ice sheets on land. As these ice sheets melt, we're going to be seeing global sea levels rise. And this affects everyone across the world. It can lead to more extreme weather events. Um, and as sea level rises, you know, we have a lot of climate migration that's also going to be happening. And so we're starting to see this new effect of climate refugees on top of refugees already fleeing from war, conflict, and climate change is also exacerbating all of these inequalities across the world. Um, and so I think it's really important to connect polar change um, to global health, to global risks, because we're all interconnected. We're all in this one planet together. We only have one chance um, to save it in the end. And I think there's still hope left if we're able to come together um, across diverse backgrounds, across diverse fields of research, fields of studies, different ways of knowing. I think we have the solutions, it's just implementing them that we're a little bit too slow at doing. And so I encourage you all to talk about these changes. And if there's one thing I would love for you to take away from this is that polar change doesn't stay in the poles. It affects everyone all around the world and what happens in these regions. Um, we should keep an eye on because it is the canary in the coal mine and um, I think you know we can't shut that blind eye and pretend it's not happening and so um, you know take action now um, would be my message so thank you guys so much and just uh, really looking forward to our new grant with the Wellcome Trust and, and getting all of this amazing research together thank you Thank you very much, Arthi. Brilliant. And last but certainly not least, uh, I wanted to end these kind of speed talks by hearing from Jill Einhorn from the World Economic Forum to share with us a bit about what WEF is doing uh, in this space. Please, Jill. Would you also like to use the... It's okay. I'm, I've okay. got a few minutes. So. Hello everyone, we are at 1.48 degrees of warming and that was just announced and scientists think that we're going to reach the 1.5 degrees in the next 12 months. Now that's not the 1.5 degree Paris target because that's the average over time but it is an indication of where we're headed and given that we are on a trajectory today of 2.6 degrees we're certainly uh, seeing significant risks of breaching that 1.5 degree uh, limit which is a physical limit it's not a political target so we're not far away from that but we also do still have time and so we're caught in this interesting space where it's within our power to choose how we are responding now and what we are going to do to be able to action what's needed to limit and avoid as much harm as possible in the future. 
Now, the Global Risk Report is an annual perception survey, which uh, Gail mentioned. And what we are seeing is that people are waking up to these risks. So number one on the top 10 year horizon is extreme weather. Number two are critical changes to Earth systems. Those two indicators are effectively the, show, the, the demonstration that humans are waking up to polar risk. Because as Arthi mentioned, of all the climate tipping points that we have, of which there are 16, we have many that are located in the poles, and five of them, five of the six that are, are at risk below two degrees, are those which, if they tip, will be ch turbocharging the others. So this is the reason that um, although if, when we go into the Congress Center, if I put a session on the agenda which says polar risk, no one will come. If I put a session on the agenda which says permafrost, it's extremely difficult to get anyone from business into the room. But the moment we talk about climate tipping points and the risks associated with that, people are there, they know what it is, and they're more and more aware of what that means. So as a civilization, we're waking up to existential threat. And the question is, what now? What do we do with that reality? It's really tough to face that. And I'd encourage a few things that we're thinking about at the World Economic Forum for everybody to, to sit with and to reflect on, because this is our approach to dealing with these issues. The first is to fully recognize the gravity of the risk. These risks are not short term. These risks are not um, only going to affect one generation. These risks are long term, they are real, and they're here and, and coming now. And we need to allow ourselves to process those emotions, the fear, the anxiety, the worry, the frustration, and the trauma response of inaction, which leads to a fight, flight, freeze, fold moment. Jamila spoke about health. Um, the mental health challenges of a trauma response are real. And one of the reasons we see less action than we'd like to see today is because people get stuck in that. Um, and we see that with uh, Jared Diamond's collapse of civilizations. He speaks about the five factors that lead to a, a society to choose to enter the path of collapse. Of those five, three are environmental, climate change, environmental degradation, and our failure to respond to those two factors. And so I want to speak just a little bit about our response, because that's really at the heart of what we need. Viktor Frankl um, is often attributed a quote, which is, between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is my power to choose my response, and in my response lies my growth and my freedom. And we have this unique opportunity of time before we hit the 1.5 degree limit, where we have a space to be able to choose that response. So the opportunity is to do that effectively and well. Now, the scientists have been raising alarm bells for the last 80 years, and we haven't seen as much response as we'd like to see. So what we're looking at is how do we help people to care about this issue? And the answer to that is to ask, what do people care about? and to frame the risk in terms of what people care about. And so while uh, the Arctic Base Camp team and Exeter University are going to be doing the science behind all of the work with Deloitte and others involved, what we're going to be looking at is what do businesses care about? What do governments care about? What do we care about? And how do we help to frame those in those terms? Now, yes, business cares about profit. They also care about relevance, and they care about their employees. Governments care about re-election, but we would hope that many governments care about their citizens as well. And we know, know that we ourselves really do care about our human health and well-being. And the three characteristics that cut across those are the health agenda that uh, Jamila was referring to. So what we're going to be doing is seeing how do we help to frame this in language that those constituents can understand, understand how does this actually Im impact business profitability, because that's going to be essential, and then showcase the path forward. So this, uh, this year in Davos, we're launching a new community called Earth Decides, and that's a community of experts and influencers who are world class, who are coming together and saying, OK, how do we both communicate with these world leading decision makers as well as collaborate with them on that path forward? 
we need to inform them of the current reality because if we don't do that, they're not going to be responding with the full gravity of the risks in mind. But we need to take them out of that trauma response and showcase that path forward in terms of where they can go. And that's the work that we'll be doing both with Earth at the sides and with this grant. So really looking forward to it. Thank you, Gail, and the Arctic Base Camp team, as well as Exeter, for all of your work, and looking forward to the next three years. Thank you very much, uh, Jill, and all three of you for those really inspiring talks and a great way to kick off this panel discussion. Uh, next, I'd actually like to invite our two youth ambassadors from Arctic Base Camp to come to the stage and, and take a seat. Um, these two youth ambassadors have been with us since uh, Saturday, I believe. We, we arrived here and they've been camping with us and uh, they, they're amazing people and they've been true warriors to be camping with us throughout the week. So maybe first, uh, you both can introduce yourselves. Hello. Hi, my name is Angela. I'm a youth ambassador with Arctic Base Camp. I'm a Chinese American. I study at Harvard, studying economics and environmental policy. Hi, everyone. Super great to be here. My name is Renata Overenga. I'm from Brazil, also a youth ambassador at the Arctic Base Camp, camping out this week. And I'm also the founder of Empodera Clima, which is a gender and climate justice org based in Latin America. Super great to be here. Thank you. Thank you. And I have a general question for you both after listening to these three incredible speeches that you've heard, um, what is your general feeling about the current state of the kind of climate crisis, the health crisis? Do you have a message for the people at uh, Davo? Absolutely, um, and as a young ambassador, I think it's really important to highlight the impacts of climate and tipping points on health, but specifically on the health of young people, the health of your children, your nieces, your nephews, your cousins, etc., because young people are the heart of their communities. And so I think growing up, um, one of the biggest effects that I already have been feeling is the urban heat island effect, which is directly impacting how students are able to take exams, are able to perform in their educational systems. and as the, there's increased carbon parts per million, they actually decrease their scores as well. And on top of that, um, I think the youth movement and the youth population is representative of a lot of other communities. If you're a young climate refugee or you're from a war-torn background, that amplifies these risks, right? Because there is a humanitarian crisis going on in these refugee camps where there's a lack of sanitation. Additionally, there's impacts on vector-borne diseases and the increases of that we've seen with the uh, a pandemic that just had happened before all of these mechanisms are compounding upon each other and it's unfair to us that we are facing these effects whenever you guys were the ones who are making those decisions and that intertemporal gap I think is fundamentally unjust. Amazing yeah completely agree with all of that and I mean I think when we're talking about the climate crisis, right, we're talking about intersectionality, of course, we talked about health here today. These social aspects are central to climate, and I feel like they're not often or always in these high-level spaces like Davos uh, centered, as they should be. So I mentioned I work a lot on gender, and when I was thinking about what to say here, I'm, I was thinking about sexual and reproductive health and rights. I don't know if everyone has made these connections of the tipping points to these rights, uh, but some of the points that I wanted to highlight uh, are, for example, maternal health or even gender-based violence, right? If we're thinking about a situation of a climate disaster anywhere in the world, we think about women, we think about how are they going to evacuate in a scenario of having to take care of small children or having that really patriarchal role in society. And in gender-based violence, I mean, that comes out a lot in women that are responsible for fetching food or water for their families. And so you start to see all these connections. And when you put youth into, the, into these intersection of uh, health, climate, gender, that gets even worse. You can think about girls' education and climate. You've seen probably with COVID how we've had many girls that were not able to go to school, many youth, of course, but when you think about girls, they're often a step behind, maybe because if they're on their period, 
period poverty. Sometimes they can't go to school because of that. Or in a climate disaster, they have to be the ones helping their families at home so they're not allowed to go to school. Or even they're forced to have a child marriage so that their families don't have to worry about this extra kind of burden, right, during a situation of climate disaster. So really, so important that here in Davos, at COP, at all these spaces, we're thinking about all of these intersections and also not just thinking about it, not just talking about the science, but bringing these people, these young women, to these spaces, right? Bringing these young women to discuss these issues, talk about their lived experiences. That's how we're going to get out of the situation. Because if we have the most marginalized groups, the people with the actual lived experiences here, we're probably going to have better results. That's what we've seen in parliaments, congresses, high level spaces. And so I'd encourage you all, when you are in these powerful spaces, bring them up, talk about them, break up their stories, and in the future, also bring them with you if you can. Thank you. Thank you both so much. And if you'd like, I welcome you to stay on the panel. Uh, and then if there's questions from the audiences, uh, I encourage you to also participate. So maybe the rest of the panelists can come and take a seat. Um, perhaps you can move down one, Renata and Angela. And then I welcome um, Alex, Jamila, Jill, and Vanessa to join us on stage. <laughs> Talk and about girl power. I know. <laughs> and perhaps just to kick things off, um, I always prefer if the people do the introduction rather than me reading out a long introduction for everybody. So maybe we can just go left to right and say a few words about um, who you are. And we'll start with you, Alex. Hi, I'm, I'm Alex Gerasi. I'm a professor at the University of Exeter, but <clears throat> I, I think I have one of the longer titles in the university. And that my official title is Pro Vice Chancellor and Executive Dean of the Faculty of Environment, Science, and Economy. And I'm also the Dean of the Business School at the University of Exeter. So uh, I'm. Well, I, and I am Gail's boss. Um, uh, that, uh, I think that's really why I'm here. I said I'm, I'm, I'm Gail's boss. Um, but one of the things I'll say is um, one of the reasons. Well, a I love I love Gail, um, but that it's on it's on tape. It's fine. It'll be in the professorial salary review too, Gail. Don't worry. Um, is that Gail really embodies what we try to do both at the business school, but also in our faculty, which is you know our faculty's pretty pretty exciting because it does bring together um, physical sciences, environmental sciences, and the business school together. It's a quite unusual combination in a university, but we really do feel that we need to bring together the climate science, and Exeter has five of the top 100 climate scientists in the world. That's more than any one university, all in the little southwest of the UK. It's a pretty special place. But also with people who are doing amazing technology and innovation and trying to come up with ways that we can do things like carbon capture. How do we, how do, we do the innovation that's going to be necessary to help combat some of the climate change we're seeing? But also bringing together economists, psychologists, organizational behaviorists like me. Um, to think about how do we get people to change their behavior? Because we need to bring all three of those together to actually be able to make change. One of those on their own is not going to do it. So it's a really exciting place to be right now and really happy to see you guys on this panel. And it brings together so much we do on a day-to-day on -day basis. And it's, it's just fantastic. Also, to be on a panel of all women, I'm usually um, the only one. So it's, it's, it's lovely to be with you today, ladies. Thank you so much. My name is Vanessa Grant, and I'm combining my passion and my profession today. I am the chair of Arctic Base Camp. I have the honor to work with all of these phenomenal women, and men as well, and <laughs> people who don't identify with either gender. Yeah. Uh, but I am kind of psyched about the, uh, X, the XX chromosome panel, I'm not going to lie. Um, my passion is Arctic Base Camp. I am Canadian. I am very concerned about speaking science to power. We also have a new initiative, Climate Base Camp, where we speak science to culture. And the polar tipping points are of extreme concern to me in my passion. But that combines with my profession. I am a senior partner with Norton Rose Fulbright, an international law firm, and I co-head our private equity group. And I 
specialize in digital health technologies in that industry, and I have a particular passion for femtech. So the effects of, uh, of global climate change on women in particular and women in underserved jurisdictions. My passion combines with my profession because our clients and the folks with whom I work all across the spectrum from universities and research all the way to major multinationals are trying to find solutions and our firm supports them in actually activating those solutions. So we act for private equity social impact funds, which are funding on the ground solutions to these global climate tipping change point problems in the healthcare sector. It's an honor to be here. It's an honor to be on this panel and we welcome your questions. Over to you, my dear friend, Jill. Thanks very much. So I'm Jill Einhorn, <clears throat> I'm South African, and I've been working at the World Economic Forum for 10 years. When I joined, uh, I, it was just a team of 10 people. We had 16 environment sessions, uh, environment and sustainability sessions on our official program, um, and now we have over 150 just on nature and climate. And so that just goes to show how uh, the agenda has expanded with time and how important these issues are. I stay at the cutting edge of that, so I'm the head of innovation and transformation what are the horizon issues that business policy makers, philanthropists, our communities are not uh, integrating into their world. Um, and the polar agenda is probably the number one on my list of priorities that people are not fully understanding. And so very keen to continue to work with uh, Arctic Base Camp and Exeter University on helping to raise awareness, but not just awareness, uh, move that very swiftly towards action. So uh, as mentioned before, I have a health background. I now head a fairly new Center for Planetary Health in Malaysia. Um, and the center is a little bit of a think and do tank within a university, a non-profit private university. And what we do is you know, some research, we do policy thinking, uh, we teach uh, students, and we also link it with uh, action on the ground, either through programs or even advising governments on certain policies. Uh, we are barely three years old, and one of my proudest things I think we've achieved is, number one, we have now made it mandatory for every undergraduate from this year onwards. They cannot graduate from the university uh, without completing a seven-week mandatory planetary health course. Uh, the second thing is we push the government to uh, include planetary health in their national uh, development plans, the five-year national development plans. And we are now embarking on probably the first in the world national planetary health action plan. Um, I tell Johan and others, and he's quoted me, that as an obstetrician, the three words I use most are push, push, and push. <laughs> so, and I think it's the only thing that works. And push at the right time. <laughs> That's brilliant, thank you all. And I'd just like to note that we are bang on time, so well done, panelists. <laughs> I, I didn't have to cut you at any point. Um, so basically for the rest of the session, it's uh, about answering your questions. I have questions that I like to ask, but I really welcome all of your questions as well. So if you have a question at any time, raise a hand. Arthi's going to help me kind of pass around a microphone. And um, yeah, we have a lot of wealth of, of talent and information on this panel uh, that can answer those questions. And we already have one. Sorry. Arthi's on her way. I'm quite loud, I can shout. Um, it's, a, it's a question um, to Professor Alexander. Um, uh, behavioural change is so important and critical to any movement. I'm just wondering what you think the... Uh, I'm used to behavioural change in an organisation, not a kind of a system level or you know, governmental level. What do you think are the critical behaviours to address or the, or the first steps to nudging society in the right direction? I, I mean, I think we're starting, you know, I, it's hard. I think that's, I mean, that's fundamentally one of the keys. Vanessa and I were actually talking about this. Um, I don't know if that was last night or this morning. It's, it's blending all together. Um, but, you know, money, money talks. And so I do actually think that the importance of getting organizations, big organizations that have that influence to be able to sway um, governments 
because we, we need to incentivize right behavior on the governmental level. You know, we were having, I was having a lovely conversation about the price of oil. And you know, we do see when the price of oil goes up, um, governments like the US and UK, nobody record, nobody, I don't record that, no. Um, right, they, they tend to start opening up oil, right, in their own countries, which, you know, that's not what we should be doing, but we keep seeing that. So we actually need governments and organizations to, to keep to their promises of, okay, are you gonna go green, right? But we also have to hold them accountable. So, you know, this is about voting, you know, encouraging people to vote. You are always gonna have some differences of opinion, right, there are people, but it's around keeping people honest and accountable. So I think that's one of the biggest things we can do. But as an ordinary citizen, you have purchasing power. So do the work on who you're buying from look at the funds you are investing in, right? There's a lot of greenwashing out there. Please do the work and only buy and invest in the right companies because they're the ones that are also going to be able to push, put pressure on governments in ways that, you know, my single vote only does so much as does yours. They do matter, but I think our purchasing power is one of the biggest things we can do to individually influence. If I may just add to that, um, from our perspective, I mean, we work with the people who finance the companies that are going to transform this. And so let's not underestimate the value of social impact funds. Remember, the private economy is bigger than the public, public economy. And so we work with both the funds that invest in them and those small companies, and I'll talk about a couple of them in a minute because there's some really interesting, there's fascinating stuff going on, that leverage digital technology to efficiently deliver health care in both, in all regions of the world. One example, we don't work with them, uh, but they're publicly on the record. Gates Foundation funded them a couple of years ago. They're called MacroEyes. They're in the U.S. They actually have geolocation technology to efficiently deliver, uh, in this case, the Gates Foundation uh, grant was to deliver vaccines in Tanzania. And interestingly, they do not rely on wireless data. They can geolocate in the absence of all wireless. It's fascinating what innovation is doing at the very local level. There are incredibly smart people. They come out of universities like the University of Exeter and others. They are dynamic and there are social impact and frankly regular venture capital funds who will fund them because it makes really good business sense. Mm. And frankly, I am excited about the data that we have and the data that Arctic Base Camp brings because it is data and evidence-based and our clients and those with whom we work are interested in investing in and developing evidence-based programs to solve these problems. I'm not going to say technology is going to save us, but it's one of many tools and there are many many folks who are out there in the business world who realize that this makes business sense. There's a social impact fund uh, for women, children, and adolescent health. It comes out of Canada, but they invest internationally. They're actually at the forum now. And again, there's social impact, and they invest in dynamic technologies that are going to serve underserved countries, but they also serve the entire world. So I appreciate the behavioral change. I agree. I think lots of people are there. I think, but business is also there. And to your point, I, I don't like to say follow the money. I am kind of the money girl, don't, don't kid yourself. But, but money can do really great things and there are many people who are making investments that, will, that are profitable, but that will also ultimately change that climate dynamic and serve people in the healthcare system. And I don't want to underestimate the fact that there are solutions. And people are prepared to pay for them. It's great. I have another question there. Go ahead. Yes. Hi. Thank you so much. Um, first of all, I'm joining from the Welcome Trust, so congratulations on your brilliant oh God, work. We it's love so you. Exciting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and on this brilliant panel, it's really fascinating, so thank you. And I think building on the previous question, and perhaps if I can direct this to Jill and Jamila, but also would love others' comments on it, 
Um, you've talked a bit about how you communicate to politicians and governments, and I would love to learn, especially from your experience in Malaysia, how you found a way to kind of effectively and persuasively communicate the links between climate change and health to policymakers. And I know, Jill, you mentioned before that, of course, governments should care about their citizens' well-being, but I think also short-term wins are so important in terms of election cycles. So any lessons that you can share would be really brilliant. Thank you. Shall I come? So if I can just say that I see philanthropists from the perspective of the grants that they fund, and I just want to mention that I think that the Wellcome Trust is way ahead of this game, and it's really exciting to see the areas that you're investing in. The Wellcome Trust funds both our climate and health program within our Center for Nature and Climate, which is based in our center and in our healthcare industry. So it's a joint venture which is, is really impactful because it helps to mobilize the industry, but it also helps through our Center for Nature and Climate's work to connect in with everything that we're doing. And also now through um, our global collaboration work um, and this, this new grant on polar health. And I think the polar health nexus is the one which so many people don't understand. And it's really to be funding communication and research at this stage in time is, is, is really a ahead of the game. So my learning is, uh, and, and because I've experimented with putting these things uh, in front of our industry teams, in front of CEOs, in front of uh, uh, heads of state and government and seeing how do they respond, what I've realized is actually the way in which we need to term what we're doing is very different from the research that is needed in order to come to the conclusions to inform that information. And so bridges are need to be needing to be built between the academic world world and the world of policy and business because if I put a scientist who's just talking about the science in front of them, they will go to sleep or they will not attend. In fact, I've even been in rooms where I've had a scientist in the room and everybody's on their laptops working because they're just like, I don't even know why I'm here. So um, that's why the language that we use when we communicate might not, might not necessarily have any of Arthi's frameworks in it, but it's underpinned by that science. And I think that's where the bridge doesn't exist as well as it could. And it's in that top section where people tend to get fall off into the stream and not get to the other side in both directions. And that is a part of the work of Earth Decides. How do we help to bridge that? But it's also a part of the work of helping the scientists to feel more comfortable speaking in new terms and also helping the businesses and the policy makers to feel more comfortable with untraditional actors in the room of which I would incorporate the climate activists and the youth. So I think as, as much as we're able to build those bridges, which is why I'm after 10 years, I'm still at the World Economic Forum because I see that role of bringing people together. So you asked me about politicians and policymakers, and this is on record. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so if you've been following Malaysian politics since 2018, six years, we've had six prime ministers. Mm, I can't even count now. One, two... Three, four, I'm sorry, five prime ministers, oh, okay. right? Um, so you can imagine the quite turbulent environment of who do you actually speak to now, right? So I think the most important thing is civil servants. People are actually doing the work. Um, you know, the top civil serv servants who are the ones who will develop the proposals, you know, the policies and bring it to political masters. Um, I think for me, I would say it's quite a unique uh, position for me. Uh, number one, I've delivered many babies. Many of them now are in government or in private sector, uh, or you know, uh, who I can, or their parents, who I can make them feel very guilty for keeping me awake at three in the morning. Uh, so I think it's the network that you build, right? Number one. Number two, the, the who are the people who will speak to these people? They have to be people that are trusted. Mm. So I think that. Um, uh, if, you do, if you go to my country, you go to government, you mention my name, you either get, oh, she's great, oh, so she's a pain, <laughs> right? So you have to be both friendly at times, but also a real pain uh, when it matters. So I think, you know, finding these people who can really, you know, a bit of good cop, bad cop, you know, trying to use the space that they have in negotiating, negotiating that. The third is be very clear what you want and build the case why it's important. For me, the pandemic was actually um, that moment 
uh, just to share that I was actually happily in my job in Geneva and the pan pandemic happened, the COVID outbreak. And at the time in Geneva, those who were there, you couldn't get a test easily. Whereas in Malaysia, you can walk in and get a test from the pharmacy. So my, my family who was in Malaysia said, come home. Uh, they were worried that you know I might drop dead at home. Nobody knew, so I got on a plane and uh, thought you know the office was going to close and work remotely. I arrived and two days later I was called into the prime minister's office, handed a piece of paper to say you're now the national advisor for COVID. So that uh, was tough, right? And I was trying to do two jobs at the same time. Then I had to leave my wonderful job in Geneva, but. You know, I've never looked back because that gave me an opportunity to sit inside government and see how it actually works or how it actually doesn't work, right? So using a crisis as an opportunity, that's the best time you get things done, really. In all my 20 over years experience in, in humanitarian work, every crisis is a huge opportunity. We have this opportunity now. How do you then tell, how do you give that narrative that COVID did not arise out of the blue? It was because we allowed the planet to be so damaged and our behaviors, right? And this is why planetary health is about health in the age of the Anthropocene, which we are in now, is the choices we make, the way we consume, our value systems. So I think getting that opportunity and slowly finding those opportunities, oh, maybe there's a policy being developed there, Let's go and talk to them, you know, and another and another. So it was really hard work, but I was very lucky that when you're in that position of trust, it's easy to convince. And the third thing is that persist. You have to be stubbornly persistent. I've survived so many prime ministers. I'm still talking to all, the, all of them. They still talk to me uh, because I've maintained that, you know, I have my political uh, beliefs. But my most important thing is I'm very focused on what I want to achieve for the country and for humanity writ large. And I think it's make that super clear that you're not here because you're jumping on a political bandwagon. So, so that's my personal journey. But I will tell you that in, in my humanitarian career, and I've worked in some of the most complex humanitarian environments in the world, right? Uh, and you know, I've been shot in Iraq, and I've been through everything, right? And all that time, every crisis offered me an opportunity to talk to government. You know, you, you, I got shot in your country trying to help you. Now you need to do something for me, right? So finding those moments that, at the end of the day, people are human. And you must be able to connect on a human level and, and, and you know, speak plainly, speak from here, right? Uh, you'll never see me carrying text because it has to be authentic that you really want this not for yourself. Right? I, I do this because it's intergenerational justice. You know, my future grandson, who's going to be born in May, you know, I've got to make sure that he has a, a, a better future for him. Because my parents and my grandparents gave me a better life. And I owe it to those future generations to give them a better life. So, you know, but that's a very personal journey for me. I cannot tell you how, I mean, I, I have no guidebook on how to, to address governments because every government is different. But the most powerful thing I think I did is to work with young people. Right, so r right now, you know, what we're also doing is we're ru we are running policy boot camps for young people because they don't learn how to ad analyze policies and all that if you're a science student or whatever, right? So, so I think now what we're trying to do is really radically uh, turn education on its head and to run you know, planetary health boot camps so that they can critique uh, uh, policies and we take their new policy ideas to the government to say, can you give these kids one hour of your time? Honourable Minister, we'll, we'll serve lunch, but let the kids talk. And you'd be amazed now, you know, Malaysia is not known for one of those countries that's very open to civil society. It's become very open, bringing young people into policy making round tables and so on and so forth. Thank you. I, I'd also like to see if Angela and Renata have a comment on this because they may be youth, but they're incredibly experienced speaking with governments and attending COPs. Is there anything you want to add? Definitely. I mean, I was just thinking about what you both said. You talked about working with youth, right? And I think that's key. It's seeing young people not as, you know, maybe that one speaker that you bring to the panel and then you leave after they talk or something like that, but really speaking to them as agents of change themselves, right? Speaking to them uh, on the same level, which I know it may seem basic, but it's really not happening at a lot of levels. Government, as you said, sometimes we have ministers of youth. In Brazil, we do, but 
sometimes they're really, you know, in their 40s, it's not really <laughs> the youth that you want to target, right? That's why I said before about bringing the people with lived experiences. Again, not to check the youth box, right? It's because, as you said, they have experiences. Like, we have graduate degrees, master's degrees. We have work experience. It's people that can speak to you from uh, an expertise that may be more creative sometimes, bolder, different, innovative, right? And that's what we need, right? We've been having so many uh, World Economic Forums, so many COPs, so many of these events, and I think what was missing in the past was these all these alternate, why right, untraditional, as you said, you groups to these ta to these tables. My experience is more with COP, and I've seen how now we have more access. Right in in the first COP I attended back in 2015, COP 21, we had maybe 10, 20 Brazilian youth. Now we have. 500, we have COP30 in Brazil coming up. Uh, but still, a lot of the times we are in the activist media spaces, right? We're not really in the negotiations. We don't have any youth negotiators in Brazil. I think some countries are starting to catch up to that. And I think that's kind of that switch that we need to bring, is bringing youth to the table, because that will change, as I said before, the outcome, right? I think that's part of why we're where we are, is because we haven't had indigenous youth, for example, talking the talk about what they do locally in this global level. So it's really just translating what's already happening, the wonderful work already taking place on the ground to these spaces like Davos. We probably should have reordered the panel and started like, you know, started right across. <laughs> I would have been at the end here, but, but to Jill's point, we're so grateful at Arctic Base Camp that we are building that bridge. Yeah. And we are very, very grateful for us, for our partners like the Wellcome Trust, like University of Exeter, like the World Economic Forum, to help us do that translation. And I'm kind of at the end trying to bring business along. But as I say, it makes good business to do this. And that's, that's the solution focused. But we do need that bridge. And that's what Arctic Base Camp and Climate Base Camp brings to the table is that speaking science to power, speaking science to culture, and ensuring that that academic science and that important evidence-based data gets translated to business leaders and then gets translated into solutions. I so let's reorder the panel because we should start from the ground with you guys and move our way right, right across. Because I, I would just add to that, you know, I'm going to say something nice about the UK government. It doesn't always happen, but they, they have invested five million pounds with the University of Exeter in a specific initiative around creating business savvy academics. And I think that's this fundamental component because we also do know that it's about 70% of UK PhDs go work in industry. So there's a natural transition, but we actually need to be able to talk to each other. And being able to, and I, I will say this, every time I interview an academic, it doesn't matter what job it's for, I say, listen, explain to me what you do in two minutes. I'm not an expert in your field. If they can't answer that question, I do not hire them. Because if you can't do that, how can you possibly communicate with the broader world? Mm -hmm. And we have to be focusing on this and we have to be able to employ academics that can talk across boundaries and aren't just talking to the three other people in the world that do exactly what they do. I know they love talking to each other, mm -hmm. but we're not going to get change un unless we can actually communicate that. And, you know, this is one of the things that really drew me to Gail when we hired her. Uh, I'll say more nice things about her when she's not here, um, is that she does an incredible job of that and that we need those people that can translate. And I think the other thing I think Arctic Base Camp does really well, and WEF is using visuals, using the narrative that bring people along because I can, I can tell you about it, some sort of fancy mathematical model, but if, look at that polar bear, right? Not me. No, not the polar bear, she's not a polar bear. Uh, she might be Canadian, but she's not a polar bear. Um, but you know, that's the kind of visual that impacts people in a way that a fancy climate model doesn't. So I think we really need to think about the science of communication as well in order to get our pictures, get the message across.
Angela? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I spent my last three summers working in federal government or multilateral organizations. I was most recently at the White House. I've been at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, the UN Capital Development Fund. And in each of these roles, I realized that while the senior program managers get to take a lot of credit for the work that's being done, all of the work that they don't want to do goes to the interns, right? Yeah, we get coffee, but also we like do other things. And I remember, I'm not going to say which of these three roles, but in one of them, they didn't know the language to ask me how to filter an Excel spreadsheet. And I was just in shock because I was like, my first PowerPoint I made was when I was six. And I think we just have like grown up in a different environment of the types of tools that we're familiar with using. And I wish that people would ask me about like, oh, like how do you, what do you think of the social cost of carbon instead of like, oh, what do you think about like, oh, like having more youth in climate, right? I think there needs to be very specific accredited roles for youth to engage in um, that are institutionalized into not just youth advisory councils, but why can't we just be on advisory councils as board members with voting power, just like any other person in any other population. Um, and I think that that would create a lot of change um, because we would have that veto say as well. Excellent. Just to quickly add to that, I completely agree. So as a science policy advisor for the Canadian government, you know, we always say, oh, talk to the politicians. But you have to talk to their advisors. It doesn't matter what the politicians think. They're reading my brief. <laughs> so <laughs> really find the chief of staff. They're the people with the power and their staff below them because we're the ones writing the brief, not the politicians. Yes. But I'm going to pass it over <laughs> here for a question. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Simi. I'm a primary care physician in the UK and also teach primary care in uh, the UK and in Lagos. Um, my question is really to all of you. Um, you talked about communicating with policymakers, but actually in Lagos, where I was born, um, plastics is creeping into my doorstep. It literally scares me when I'm driving down the road as to how huge it is and um, bags and and people are literally dying from this. But the communication to people as to this is almost impossible, simply because there are bigger problems yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. for us to deal with, or yeah. people think the bigger problems, which are linked to this. So um, even though I'm working with primary care and you know primary care centers, bringing this sort of conversations in is very difficult and how to articulate that. I mean, when you mentioned the photo, I'm thinking maybe there's some way we can put those photos and put their life expectancy next to it and their lungs, and maybe we can get plastics completely out of Lagos. So how do we develop those conversations with places like, I know Lagos is probably a small microcosm of your problems, but you know, there's a bigger a conversation, I and mean, it makes a big difference. You know. Can I just turn this to Kathy for a minute? Because I'd love you to talk about our Arctic Risk platform it, it, and, and sort of the hits we were getting on that and where the hits were coming from. Because people are desperate for information, and they're desperate for data. As I say, we're going to be developing something with, with, um, with the help of the Wellcome Trust and our other partners. Um, to precisely that, so I'm, I'm taking mental notes, thank you, and I'm speaking on my Arctic Base Camp uh, chair hat, but I, I'd really like you to talk about that because I think that was really sh surprising and important to me. So over to you, Kathy. Yeah, essentially that or organically we were seeing that a lot of the people that were responding to our messages on social media were from climate vulnerable regions. So then once we specifically targeted them, it was actually incredible to see the feedback that we were getting. So people just craving this type of information on climate risks. So the video I showed at the top, like that was just one example. And that's part of the things that kicked off this idea for this welcome grant is that there's obviously a desire for people to have this type of information and be communicated in a way that they can then take home with them. So, you know, translating that science into a way to, that speaks to their microcosm. Like, I think that's really important that everyone's microcosm is equally important and valid and needs to be taken into account. So, yeah, that, that's a really good point. But anyone want to jump was, on that? I was just going to remark, I, I remember a couple of years ago when all of a sudden, almost overnight, plastic straws disappeared from the UK. And what, what was that? Oh, I think that was a, a BBC documentary with, with Attenborough. You know? So there are some, sometimes a simple image can, can make a massive change. Or there's that fantastic photo of the little seahorse with his um, cotton swab that he was holding on to instead of his seaweed or coral. So I, you, were, you were talking about the, the imagery and it's, it is really thinking about, you know, how do you raise that 
as an issue. And I've, I've seen this, I, I spent a lot of time in Indonesia and the Philippines where oftentimes you see a, a lot in the water. Yeah. You know, um, we joke about going to Flip Flop Beach, right? There's just one of the places I dive. It's an amazing dive site. But when you come to the surface, yeah. it's full of flip flops. You know, how, how does this happen? You know, but by starting to engage with the, the communities, right, they are starting to clean up and engage and, and clean that up because they're starting to recognize that actually by having a more attractive environment, they're bringing tourism income and creating value out of that natural environment as well. So I think there may be multiplex complicated messages, but it's some maybe just simple images to, to start with to get people to recognize we need to change our behavior, but it, it, it's 100% hard. It's 100% difficult, but you know, I, I take the straw as a really positive message, and I am like mortified anytime I go somewhere and they hand me a plastic straw. I'm just like, do you not know about the straw? But you can get some simple messages that way. Perhaps to reflect on the forum's journey here, uh, we were looking to raise the issue of plastics on the agenda and we weren't sure how. Um, and we decided to go for one short, sharp fact, which was incorporated in a report, and that was there will be more plastic than fish in the sea by 2050 if we continue on our current trajectory. And that fact was then quoted across the world as the justification for action to be able to move on this. And now I think it's about eight years later, we have the Plastics Treaty, which is in the process of final negotiations this year. And so to see how that trajectory has moved and how swiftly it's moved, and we've got a global plastics action uh, partnership which with a, a lot of the, the national governments actually who've signed up and who are teaching each other how to do this. So the idea is one learns, the other learns, and they come to the forum to get that knowledge and to work with partners on it. But it's not just the policy that ne is needed, although it's very effective because suddenly you see all the plastic straws disappearing. You also need the industry to, to shift. And this is a petroleum industry. That's what plastic's made of. And there are many plastics alternatives. So we have have Uplink, which is an innovation platform where we put out challenges to the world to say, we've got this issue, plastics is one of them, do you have any innovations? And we actually collect those innovators together in cohorts and help them to learn from each other. So we're not just enabling the ecosystem of policy makers through GPAP, but also the ecosystem of innovators to help to shift the agenda. So that's a little bit of the way that the World Economic Forum thinks about impact. Yes, we can say no thank you, no plastic straw, but the fact that that plastic straw is there means the industry hasn't woken up. So that's where we need to shift the incentives. If I may add to that, I think that it's what you need to do is at all levels, right? At an individual level, as a physician, uh, seeing patients, as policymakers. So I think the legislation is also key. And then not just leg legislation, you know, the enforcement mm. and what kind of, uh, you know, penalties there are. So I always tell people Rwanda has a, you know, policy, there's no single-use plastic. Learn from Rwanda, right? And, uh, you know, it's not, you're not learning from a country in the global north, a country that's decided as a policy this is important. Now, I think the health sector, and I, I speak to you as a doctor to doctor, we are among the most trusted people in the world, right? And we, every survey that's done by Edelman or something, it's always nurses are the most trusted, you know, doctors and so forth. How do we now convey this message? How many of us, when we see our patients, if they are carrying something plastic, right? To say, you know, would you like to think of an alternative to that? And I think now that the data is on the fact that it's in breast milk, it's in fecal material, baby's fecal material, we have huge opportunity to educate. And the other thing, of course, is visuals matter, but it's also who you're talking to matters, right? Because um, if I go to the fisherman community, I, I can't, you know, they don't have access to many of these visuals, perhaps. But to ask them simple things like, do you notice you're getting more infections nowadays? Are you getting more sick? You know, it's because of heat, right? Um, so how do you relate to them on things that, how many days do you not, are you not able to go out to sea? Or if you're a boat operator of the islands of Sabah, are you seeing that tourists are not coming because there's more plastic in the ocean? Something like that, that uh, impacts their own livelihoods as well. And let's not underestimate the value of a sense of humor. Yeah. Um, confession, my husband's a cartoonist, uh, but that has nothing to do with that, although I have a lot of sense of humor in my home. We, um, 
we do a few things at Arctic Base Camp because we'd also like to bring hope and a sense of humor to the messaging. And it doesn't mean that the message is any less serious. It just means you're going to listen to it better. Uh, so we have on our website an Arctic risk name generator. <laughs> um, mine is, sorry, i got to find all my things, Vanessa Uncontrollable Wildfires Grant. I'd love Kathy to talk about it a little bit more in a minute in the context in which we made that. We also, with Climate Base Camp, we did an activation in New York saying Save the Flavors, where uh, some of our influencers were kind enough to join us, handing out flavors of ice cream uh, that are generated from crops that are immediately in danger. And we're going to talk about agricultural risk uh, here on Friday at 9 o'clock if you're interested. And we'll talk about uh, the technology that we're bringing to uh, actually communicate that data and information. So we hope you'll join us then. Um, but what we're trying to do is communicate. And our uh, founder, Dr. Gail Wayman, whom you saw earlier, really is a translation, what I call a translational scientist. And we use humor, we, but, but we always use that uh, to get our message across, but the underlying message is consistently supported by evidence-based data that has been vetted by our fabulous scientists over here, wherever you, wherever you went. I was like, you were right there. No, you're not. Um, but Kathy, maybe you want to talk just a teeny bit, or, or you want to talk a little teeny bit about the Arctic Risk Name Generator and what, what, is, what actually comes up and why. And please go onto our website, www arcticbasecamp.org, generate your own Arctic risk name generator. Uh, we, when we, people do it, they tend to do it seven times because they sometimes don't like their names. <laughs> um, my husband thought uncontrollable wildfire was probably appropriate in the circumstances. Uh, I am not only Canadian, I'm red-haired and fiery, but you know, that's not actually a thing because I don't love the fact that I've got a name that suggests real risks of climate change. But Arctic risk name generator. <laughs> Thanks, Vanessa. This is why we put her on the panel, actually. Um, yeah, the whole idea of the Arctic Name Changer was to find an easy way to start a conversation. Um, and I believe my name was Kathy Loopy Jetstream Serbara. And it's an easy way to say, how do we start talking about it, Arctic? And it's normally to have a laugh, um, but then also to see underneath that humor, what is the underlying science and what's the underlying message. So it's one of the first things you do if you come to see us in the tent. We will make a name for you, and then people kind of walk away with that name, and it automatically sparks conversations with the other people they meet. And when we first launched it, uh, it went viral. Rain, uh, who is on the uh, board of Arctic Base Camp and co-founder of Climate Base Camp. He also, Rain Wilson, changed his name and um, helped kind of promote the message. So using also influencers in that space as well. Thank you for that great question. Thanks. Do you have a comment? That yeah, so I just wanted to say a quick comment in regards to kind of the youth conversation. Ooh, I think I'm getting feedback, sorry. Mm -hmm. We were having, um, and when I, when I first joined the space of kind of activism and science communication and science policy, I was viewed as a youth. Even though I had a doctorate degree, I had, you know, worked for the government for five years as a policy advisor, um, I had to somehow move myself away from the youth name in order to be taken seriously, which is absolutely crazy because if you look at the youth, youth who are here, who are young women, they're not youth, um, they've done more work than so many other people, but for some reason age matters. And I think I would love everyone here to think about that when they move away and when they go hire people or work with people that age doesn't matter, experience matters, um, lived experiences matter, and we need to stop kind of pinning people into these groups um, in order to work with them. And I just, I just think that's really important to say, so I just wanted to put that out there. Um, but if we have any other questions, I think we can still take one more. Interested in what your Arctic name is, risk name is? Because I see people going right onto the website. Thank you. <laughs> can I make a plug? Of course. So, so we are organizing um, 
a planetary health summit in Malaysia uh, in April, and, we, and normally it's held in Harvard or you know Edinburgh and others. But I went to Harvard and I said, enough. We need to bring it to the global <laughs> south, uh, you know, where the the issues are, and you have really a reality check that not everything is uh, through Harvard tinted glasses. So I think they couldn't argue, and so I have to organize it. Um, I'd love to welcome all of you because I think it's going to be a very different kind of summit. Uh, we're going to have cartoonists on board. We are going to talk AI. We're going to, you know, bring you into the forest uh, for one day. Uh, so all sorts of things. We'd love to see all of you. Um, and just as a, as a last thing, is WHO now defines elderly as 80 oh, yes. and above. So I'm middle aged Just for your information. <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, one last question. Go ahead. Uh, hi, and thank you for the amazing panel. I'm Adriana, I'm from Brazil, and I'm working to deliver healthcare to uh, vulnerable communities with digital health. And for me, it's uh, um, clear uh, how uh, yeah, the impact of environment in health, and the opposite is true. Uh, health sector has a huge impact uh, in the environment. So, how are you? looking or, or understanding the whole of health sector um, may be leading the change of uh, energy choices and um, uh, taking digital health like a, a purpose to, to less uh, pollution and this. Jamila? Yeah, so the health sector is responsible for 5% of global emissions. Um, so in our conversation, so that, uh, uh, for example, I help the Ministry of Health also on health transformation. So I'm saying to them that, you know, we can't be hypocrites. We can't tell people that, oh, you know, you're polluting everything when you are actually causing the problem. And also, oh, by the way, all your eye drops and everything are in plastic containers. So, so. I think we have to take responsibility, number one. So what we are doing uh, as a center is that we are now teaching climate and health advocacy to health workers. So we run workshops and so forth. We work with healthcare without harm. Uh, we also, you know, during the summit, we'll be running a decarbonization of health workshop. So we're going to plan to do this regularly in partnership with the Ministry of Health. Because until you bring the Ministry of Health in, uh, then it's a difficult thing to move. The other thing, of course, is that you've got to be smart. Work with the economists, uh, you know, in your, 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 your economic uh, experts to show the actual cost-benefit of decarbonization because even from uh, the ministry did, you know, uh, a pilot in a couple of s small hospitals to, s to look at what the savings were when they transitioned from you know, the usual energy to say solar panels, and you know, we are not short of sun. So, uh, and they showed the savings were in the, in the millions. So, how do you then look at building health resilience? Th that everyone say, oh, there's a cost to it. Yeah, 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 yeah. But how do you become more efficient in the first place so that the cost that you need is not as high as you think? So, you know, this is why I'm saying, you know, I take the planetary health approach. It's a multi-systems approach. Yep. We need to get the economic experts, the private sector, everyone on board, the social scientists, the artists uh, uh, on board so that we can actually look at problem solving from a multi-systems approach. And perhaps just to compliment from the private sector perspective, what we've learned is companies like to compete. They compete for product, for, for, for market share, uh, the place where uh, their products are sold. At the World Economic Forum, what we try to do is to encourage companies to compete for good. Um, so what we do is work out, okay, we've got an issue in an industry, we'll get the leaders of that industry together to collaborate on what should the benchmark look like for that sector, how do we help that benchmark to be enabled in those companies, and then showcase that as the best, best practice, and then all the other companies have to make that call, am I going to join those f first movers or am I going to become a laggard? And what we find more and more is that companies are willing to step up to the plate and make totally different decisions than they, they would have made five or ten years ago because they recognize that the trajectory is moving and if they're not stepping up to the plate, they will be left behind. Another fun fact, not so fun actually, the cost of conflict, right? Conflict itself, um, especially armed conflict, right, uh, causes 5% of emissions. If you add conflict in health, the emissions are higher than all land transport around the world. So we've got to really be peace advocates as well, right? That uh, even conflict has a cost to climate and to humanity. 
Well, in the spirit of our compelling timing, I'm going to start to wrap things up. We have about two minutes to go. Uh, just a side note for those of you who are Googling our Arctic name generator, you can find it on our Arctic Risk platform, so arcticrisk.org, not on the uh, Arctic Base Camp website. But I just want to say a massive thank you. This is the easiest panel I've ever had to moderate because of all of the brilliant people sitting up here and all of your brilliant questions. What I loved about this panel was the interdisciplinary nature of it, not only from different geographic backgrounds, but lived experiences, different types of uh, work experiences. And to hear all of your messages have been inspiring. And I hope everybody has a lot to take away from this uh, panel. So thank you once again, and enjoy the rest of your week at Davos.